Welcome to Couples Therapy in Seven Words. I'm your co-host, Judy Alexander, and I'm here with my husband, Dr. Bruce Chalmer. Hello, Judy. Hello, viewers and listeners. Uh, Judy, tell folks our topic for today. Relationships and Parenting with Neurodiversity, an interview with Dr. Christopher Scott Wyatt. We just finished that interview, and we had a lot of fun, and he's really interesting. Yes, and... he is, and boy, did he have a lot of good things to, I mean, advice even for parents that uh, either are not neurodiverse themselves or are not dealing with neurodiverse children. Absolutely, so, and, and just great advice. To, as a little teaser here, he himself, Dr. Uh, Dr. Wyatt himself, is uh, neurodiverse. He is uh, uh, diagnosed with autism and uh, also has two daughters that have various forms of neurodiversity. And he and his wife, you know, parent those kids and, and have their own relationship and uh, really just enjoyed that interview uh, immensely. He's very, mm -hmm. very knowledgeable and very, uh, yeah. very interesting. So I uh, hope you'll enjoy that. And before we get to that uh, interview, Let's talk about some of our fun stuff. Okay. Okay. What well, should we, we talk about? What should we talk about? How about that we start this week talking about our merch? merch. Our merch. <laughs> uh, indeed, what we're holding up for those of you who are just listening to this audio, we are holding up our beautiful Couples Therapy in Seven Words mugs in the 11 and 15 ounce sizes. Uh, and on one side, you have the beautiful uh, logo, which was designed by my beautiful wife here. And on the other side, you have the inspiring, uh, what do we call it? Motto. motto. Uh, Be kind, don't panic, and have faith. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's just what you need to have your beverages in and state to the world um, mm -hmm. the idea that these are guidelines you can live by. And we not only have mugs, I actually brought up the... Um, ah. The tote bag, we can show you, those of you who are watching, get to see the lovely tote bag, uh, which has the logo on one side and the motto on the other. Mm -hmm. And if the one you're noticing on looks a little used, it's because it's, it's used. Very used. We, we use, use it, it all the time. All the time. We're always toting stuff around, and it's a really nice tote mm -hmm. bag. And, very sturdy. And how can mm -hmm. people get a hold of that merchandise? Oh, that's a great question. You know what? I think they could get it if they go to ctin7.com. That's our website. That's our CT website. CT Couples Therapy in 7, numeral 7. CTN7.com, and you will see there is a shop tab mm -hmm. where you will be able to acquire that wonderful merchandise we were just talking about. Right. Speaking of shopping, the other things that you might well want to acquire when you're watching, you know, when you're experiencing our podcast mm -hmm. is our books. So right. let's start with my most recent books, which are. It's not about communication, why everything you know about couples therapy is wrong. And that actually, it, it came up a little bit in our conversation. It um, did, it did, because with, we were uh, talking about communication. We were talking about communication. Has, you know. <laughs> and I just want to put in at this juncture, you know, the, the title of the book is It's Not About Communication. Mm -hmm. I have one particular great big exception, and our, our conversation with, uh, with Scott Wyatt was all about that that exception. The exception is if somebody is on the autistic spectrum, mm -hmm. they often are encountering actual communications issues that right. really are communications yes, issues. They miss some of the social cues exactly. that many uh, people who are not autistic. And, and he spoke really, I, I was fascinated by how he spoke about how he himself has learned right. consciously to read expressions right. in ways that... Reading for, expressions and yeah. body language and certain uh, other things. Exactly, yeah. yeah. yeah so that was, that's... That was fun. Something to look forward to. That was fun indeed. And then the book that started it all. Reigniting the Spark, Why Stable Relationships Lose Intimacy and How to Get It Back. Indeed. And that's the book that came out uh, on Leap Day of 2020 yeah just in time for the pandemic <laughs> uh, we're just getting around i, I will i'm going to put in a plug too for our some of the presentations that we're going to be doing uh we are scheduled already for i don't know if the third one's been nailed down yet but you know a few presentations uh at some synagogues uh we're going to do a presentation on jewish perspectives about sex and it's based on a book i wrote and it's also based on a another book that we've been sponsoring our podcast with. Why don't we talk? Let's let's put in a word for our sponsor right now. Okay. Oh, I don't see the book here. Oh, it should be there under something. If it isn't there, 
Um, well, silly us for not having it immediately to hand, <laughs> but I will I will put up a little picture of it on the screen for those of you watching this when I edit this So the book podcast. we've been touting is called <laughs> The Blue Tent, Erotic Tales from the Bible by Laria Zilber. By Laria Zilber. If you want to see Laria, if you want to get a look at who Laria is, mm -hmm. you can go to Laria Zilber's uh, webpage, which is... Right. LariaZilber.com, L-A-R-I-A-Z-Y-L-B-E-R.com, LariaZilber.com. Uh, those of you watching this, you will note not only is that uh, website floating above or sort of in between our heads right now through the magic of uh, video editing, but also there's a QR code, by golly. You can even scan it, <laughs> and it'll take you right to Laria's website. Yeah. Uh, and you will get to see some videos of Laria herself. Um, and if you notice, the, there is somebody who is asking her questions. That happens to be me. Yeah. And Laria herself, what can I say? She, you know, she bears a striking resemblance to someone we know very well. Yes, she does. We'll just leave it at that. If, if that, uh, if that um, piques your curiosity, then by golly, go to LariaZilber.com and you'll get to see that. And she's case, also on TikTok. So if you're on TikTok, you can go to the Laria Zilber. <clears throat> yeah, at Laria Zilber at on Laria TikTok. Zilber, yes. Right. In any case, these, these presentations, you and I are going to do the presentations. Yes, we are. Uh, and uh, just interestingly enough, and uh, you're going to be reading some of Laria's right. work. And, and if you uh, are watching this and if you think that we would uh, make good guests in your community for lectures, let us know. We're happy to go any place, we, we especially are. Europe. <laughs> Well, or an island true. in the Caribbean. <laughs> that's true. And look, we can also do it by Zoom. So we yes, can go we can. Anywhere by Zoom. Any place. And uh, yeah, and we're we're doing uh, presentations on, as they say, Jewish perspectives on sex. We we also have prepared some presentations that are not specifically about sex, but more general about uh, couples therapy and, and relationships uh, and relationships, and uh, both participating in that as well. Mm -hmm. So if you uh, want us for that, <clears throat> you can get hold of us. Yes. So. Uh, on that note, I think we I can think go we to our, our go to our interview. So we will see you on the other side. Our guest today is Dr. Christopher Scott Wyatt. Dr. Wyatt is an autistic self advocate and father of two neurodiverse daughters. He earned a doctorate while researching online education for students with autism spectrum disorders. His experiences living with physical and neurological differences shape his parenting. He launched the Autistic Me blog in January 2007 when he began working on behalf of others with special needs. Dr. Wyatt consults with schools, businesses, and nonprofit organizations on issues of autism, neurodiversity, and active inclusion. Scott, welcome to Couples Therapy in Seven Words. Thank you for having me. Our well, pleasure. Yeah, we're, we're happy to have you. We always like to ask our guests, you know, tell us something about your own journey. How did you come to do the work that you do? I struggled in graduate school in uh, several ways, but primarily in social situations. I have some physical disabilities, which were also exacerbated uh, living in Minnesota, I have a palsy and I have a dystrophy and it turns out cold weather was triggering more palsy episodes. I was having more difficulty walking using a cane and I found it difficult to explain what was wrong. I had professors and colleagues who misunderstood my body and how it moves, especially in the cold. It was jerky. I tended to tremble. Uh, I developed the habit of tapping my cane when I was anxious, trying to calm myself down. And disability services asked for a revised neurological workup. So in 2006, 2007, we did the revised neurological workup. We knew the pre-existing conditions, my wife and I, um, what we hadn't understood was that many of the labels had changed. So I went from being what had been brain trauma and early on other diagnoses was shifted to include the autism spectrum disorder. I already knew I was ADHD. We knew about the physical disabilities, but 
because I study language, the idea that what I was changed via a label mm. was fascinating to me. The idea that we update the DSM and suddenly my identity as far as doctors and others are concerned changes. And I recognize that a lot more adults were going to be diagnosed, a lot more uh, young adults as well being diagnosed with the changes in the DSM. And even when the cha uh, diagnostic and statistical manual changed from uh, the text revision to uh, edition the, to the fourth edition brought in more people as well. So it fascinated me that I was being relabeled because a book was updated. Mm -hmm. That yeah. That is one of my favorite topics, actually. I'm, I'm really curious to hear you, you talk about that. You know, when I ask people about diagnoses, I'm often, you know, there, there's two elements. I mean, one way of looking at it, there's two elements of diagnoses that I'm always wondering. One, is it accurate? But I think more importantly, is it useful? And I'm curious about your experience of having that label applied to you. Uh, you know, accuracy is one thing. Do you feel like it's useful? Has it been useful in your life? And if so, how has it been? I don't know that the label has been useful. I think it is a catch-22 in our society, especially with colleagues and supervisors who are baby boomers or maybe Gen X. There's an, uh, a bias against mental health awareness and against diagnostic labels that may or may not be evolving. I think uh, I think younger people are more aware of mental health, especially following co following COVID, um, following their experiences, they're more aware and more open to it. But I think having the labels still presents barriers in in some communities and including the academic community where they assume that if you have an impairment in social skills or an impairment uh, cognitively with executive function that you somehow can't succeed. Mm. I've talked to other autistics on my own podcast and for my blog or at conferences, and some are able to turn it into a marketing strategy for lack of a better word. Mm. Um, yeah. Professor Stephen Shore has done a great job. Temple Grandin has done a great job advocating for autism awareness while also accepting the label and working with the label. I tend to only bring it up when it comes up as, as part of what my work is in that community because I still encounter a lot of misunderstandings. I'm not a celebrity and I still encounter the misunderstandings of what it means to be autistic. Mm -hmm. Is it but it is helpful in other ways having having my daughter's diagnoses that include neurodiverse identifiers the oldest does have an autism diagnosis as well as ADHD the youngest has ADHD PTSD and some other challenges dyslexia dysgraphia potentially so we are looking at that and I would like to think that because of what I have been through with my labels and my diagnoses, that I am a better advocate and that I am better at explaining their needs and defending their needs to school systems and other institutions that don't always understand neurodiversity and special needs, especially the invisible disabilities that so many of us do have. Mm -hmm. Now, how old were you when you were diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder? Late 30s. I would say 37, oh. 38. Oh. So you went through your whole childhood and life up till that point, um, not realizing or not not having the label. But like Bruce said, it, if it did it change anything in the way people perceived you? I know, you know, you probably didn't change the way you perceived yourself, but how people reacted to you once you got that disorder, uh, once you got that label, sorry. I believe that the other labels were potentially more harmful ah. uh, because in the 1970s, the official diagnosis uh, for brain trauma was potential retardation 
So oh, when you wow. say cognitive retardation versus autism, I think autism is the better of the two. Uh-huh. Sure. But that's not saying much. No, it's interesting. Yeah, because what I tell me if this sounds right, what you're uh what you're focusing on there is the level of possibility that's allowed by that label. So that if an autism spectrum, and of course the word spectrum I always always thought is fascinating because that itself, at least in theory, allows for a lot of possibility. It says there's a lot of different ways this can manifest. And so that focuses someone on, okay, let's talk about the individual we're working with as opposed to some, you know, abstract diagnosis. I believe that the the evolving diagnostic labels have worked to be more inclusive. If we talk about fetal alcohol syndrome disorder, we talk about autism spectrum disorder, and we start putting in spectrum into several of these. I, I think there are four or five now that are listed as spectrums with matrices. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that that helps understand that we're talking about levels of support required. Mm, yeah. And different supports that might be required at different times. And I think that that helps the mental health professions. I don't believe that has trickled down even in the last 20 years to education or employment environments mm, yeah. where they still use a checklist approach of we can offer the following accommodations or this is what autism is in the classroom. So this is what we do. Um, so it, it's a mixed bag because we're slowly becoming aware uh, teacher training might help, uh, parental awareness might help, but there is a divide between even mental health professionals, how they view that spectrum. Some view it uh, in terms of severity. Mm. Well, now you've already made it constraining again. Mm -hmm. So once once you go back to that, it, it becomes problematic. And there's a real challenge with labeling labeling it as a disorder instead of a difference, even the word yeah. disorder, autism spectrum disorder. Well, now it's a spectrum of disorders, mm -hmm. not a spectrum of difference. It's a spectrum of what, how badly you're broken. Yeah. I've always felt that with ADHD, the same thing, the last D of ADHD, it's like, well, it's only a disorder in the context of people who are judging it as a disorder. Yes. And that, that would be true of, of autism spectrum disorder as well. Although in yeah, you know, I'm a I'm a retired teacher, so in some instances, I think it it was useful to have some sort of diagnostic um, and knowing how we could help students and give accommodations to students. So in that sense, I I think it was useful instead of saying, well, you know, he's just a pain in the ass, you know, <laughs> type of thing. I think that's helped. I think the the challenge in education is with 19 to 20% right now of our students being eligible for services, districts have adopted checklist approaches of, okay, for ADHD, you get extra test time, you get this yeah. accommodation, we can give you a, a limited distraction area for your assignments, we can give you these services. So, for legal compliance reason, they they have uh, developed these checklists, and while that brings them into compliance, at least on the surface, it really doesn't individualize the education program. Yep. The the eye of the IEP, it's not really individualized. It's yep. more a checklist approach because a teacher with thirty students is only going to be able to do so much that you right. can't really individualize learning you can't individualize anything so they give a checklist in the school or the university depending we'll say these are the accommodations we do for adhd these mm -hmm. are the accommodations for autistic students so i don't know that we have gotten very good at the individualization but we are at least offering consistent minimal accommodations Mm. Now, in, in your relationship with your wife, you met before you had the diagnosis, correct? Um, we've known each other since junior high. Okay. So, uh, yeah. so did that affect your relationship at all? Or basically it was like, oh, okay, just, you know, one more thing on the checklist. 
she has always worked around, you know, what we assumed was a neurological difference. We we've always assumed that okay, I need my calendars, I need my planners. Uh, many many years before I was diagnosed, I relied on my day runners. I still have you know the the old day runners that I had used. Oh yeah. I relied on when the first Palm Pilot came out, had the Palm Pilot, then had the the uh, handspring visor, which was a Palm device. So I've always used those supports that technology or even as something as simple as a day runner allows me. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't really a, a surprise that the label changed or or anything like that. It's more now we can ask what treatments or strategies are emerging but but for the most part i don't think it i don't think it changed our understanding it gave us a different label for what we already knew that mm -hmm. the sensory processing could fall under the autistic that the it, it just gave us a new rubric to grade where each behavior might be associated, but it didn't change my needs or my uh, my interactions with the environment around me. Yeah. Or perhaps it, it probably didn't change her understanding of that either. It gave you maybe some, you know, the thing a diagnosis can do, I think in its best sense, is it can hook you into some knowledge. You know, it's it's saying, well, let's classify all these particular patterns this way, and then we can centralize our knowledge of that particular pattern. And when that's effective, that can be useful. So I suppose it it sort of opened those doors, but it probably didn't change your relationship that much. Is that is that sort of what you're saying? I, I would I would agree with that. It didn't really change our understanding of our daily lives. What it changed was we both became more assertive about saying, look, these are sp special needs in certain situations and these accommodations need to be provided. Mm, yeah. We we are now more sensitive to the sometimes aggressive behaviors of employers or colleagues. We are now more aware of how to navigate these systems, not just for myself, but for our daughters. Mm -hmm. We have certainly, we, we have become aware of things where harm is being done, whether it's intentional, whether it's a bias against the behaviors and traits of autistics and ADHD or other uh, challenges so we have become more attuned to those and we have become better at saying look this is a protected disability under these rules for an adult these rules for a child you know we we expect and we we need these accommodations for our children or or even for myself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, you know, you you gave us some questions that you often are asked, and I, I found one of your questions fascinating, and I want to ask it of you. It's, why are questions about sex and relationships the most frequent you receive, even at education conferences? And I'm, I'm fascinated. I'm fascinated by why that would be so often asked. And of course, I'm also thinking those same questions, like, gee, how does this affect, you know, how does autism, as you experience it, affect, you know, sex and relationships? And, and why are you always asked about that? The number one concern of parents and guardians of autistic or ADHD neurodiverse uh, young people is whether or not that young person is going to have healthy, stable adult relationships, mm, whether yeah. we're talking friendships or we're talking romantic intimacy. Our society, our culture is very network driven social capital often outweighs financial capital. Mm, yeah. This is one of those things I, I try to explain very carefully. When we look at every culture, every culture values capital. We can all claim that, oh, how we're treated as a result of capitalist culture or American individualism or whatever. Every culture in the world values social capital. Mm -hmm. And if you do away with money tomorrow, you're still going to value people differently based on what they 
can provide. Mm, yeah. It, it just, I, I have no other way to say it. A doctor is very important when you're hurt. Mm -hmm. And that doctor's skill is that person's social capital. And parents know that this is how the world works, whether I'm speaking to someone remotely in Australia or France or Canada or English speakers in Hong Kong, all of those parents know, all of those guardians know, a social network is key to success in every one of those cultures. Mm. Um, even as I, I've worked with people from Northern Africa, they've pointed out your social standing, who your friends are, who your family is, those are your capital in those cultures. So when you have a disorder that is largely defined by communication impairment, I think it's only natural for parents to wonder, how is this person going to form these bonds with the ultimate bond being the the marriage, the, the, uh, the intimate romantic bond, that is the ultimate capstone that everyone sees as, okay, you have succeeded socially because you've been able to form a bond. It's it's a marker in most societies, even even though we don't think about it that way. Uh, getting married, having a family, these are things that in most cultures signify that you belong, mm, that you fit, yeah. that you're mm -hmm. normal. Right. And when I talk to audiences, I try to remind them, this is not just a, an American thing. Not having a spouse in many cultures is uh, considered just a horrible failure. Mm -hmm. uh, not being connected to the right family is disastrous socially. Mm -hmm. It's very, it's very interesting to me because the concerns of the parents are not invalid and they often get confused. They say, Oh, well, you know, in our, as I said, the, the thing I hear most often is, well, in our capitalist society, you need a household. It takes two people to survive. It's not like anywhere else. And then when I talk to families in North Africa, uh, part of the yeah, Somali it's like everywhere else. Yeah. yeah, it's like, oh, my son, he will never have a wife and bring shame. It's like, oh, see, that has nothing to do with money. It It's just, mm -hmm. it's a marker. It is a social marker. Yeah. Can you have a family? Can you have these connections? Do you have friends? Mm -hmm. And I, that's why those questions come up is because it doesn't matter to which audience I'm speaking. That is the ultimate sign that you belong. Mm -hmm. You know, now, of course, you yourself are a, an example of someone, I would imagine a powerful example of someone, you do have a family, you have a wife, you have a family, you have found ways of connecting. Can you, I, I'm not quite sure how to ask it, but can you comment on how did you pull that off? Or what, you know, what were the circumstances that have allowed that for you? I tell audiences, the first way to meet people and I think the most important way is through shared interest and shared connections. Mm -hmm. My wife and I do not share all of our interests by no means. There are things she is passionate about that I just, no, that's just not my thing. We're smiling but, because I'm sure we have that as well. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm just not into Mahjong. What can I tell you? You know, but yeah, I, I, you. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, my wife, um, my, but my wife and I have those areas where we, connect mm -hmm. and then we have those areas in which we diversify but where we connect is important and that's that's how i tell people they need to form those connections if you are socially awkward and challenged as i am it's amazing how you can still find your tribe your people your community your whatever you wish to call it um, i'm not I don't want to overstate uh, that uh, clickishness. Mm -hmm. you, you don't need to you know, hide away in a community, but what you need are several communities. Mm, yeah. And so my wife and I are communities that overlap. We both like nature. We like taking hikes and we like looking, you know, bird watching, going to the beach and looking at the wildlife. We love 
Uh, we, we love going to the mountains uh, in California where we grew up. We like to ride our bikes with the kids. We used to play racquetball and tennis together. And we also share a passion for reading. Mm -hmm. We love, we both are readers, but we don't always read the same things, but we are definitely passionate about books. Mm -hmm. we, are, we are lifelong learners. And it's amazing how just even sharing that lifelong learning uh, gives us a bond where there, we can sit and be 20 feet apart in the living room, each, you know, in our comfortable chairs with our lights and reading a book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, that can be together time for us. Oh yeah. So I tell uh, families, the first thing to do is find out what your young person likes to do. And you may think they need to be on a team or they may need an organization, but that's not necessary. Um, they can go, you know, you can join a bird watching group, but you're not talking a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're, you're yeah. social without the overload that many of us experience in crowded social environments. I was active in a computer programming group in Pittsburgh, very small group, just a, a group of coders that got together once a month at a, at a restaurant mm -hmm. in the back room, uh, the little conference area and just sat around and talked. Yeah. Sometimes coders, actually about I mean, programming. From my own experience, I many, many years ago working in a computer center back in the mainframe days, you know, coders as a group would tend to have autistic people overrepresented, I would think, statistically. And so that's a that would be a source of connection for a lot of folks if that's you know if that's how their minds work. Absolutely. And I yeah. for for our, our children, our daughters are in Girl Scouts. They mm -hmm. may or may not always do group activities, but they can complete the requirements for a badge they can complete the requirements for a, a a journey as they call it they can do the bronze silver and gold projects they can do those things alone or with a a, a teammate as it were our oldest is in swim well swim is sort of alone you're swimming you're mm -hmm. not really unless you're doing relay mm -hmm. um but it is not one of those sports where you have to constantly communicate with team members and read the sign language of the body movement. Um, so swim is a good sport for her. She's in band. And band is interesting because while you're playing a concert, you're following along but it's with the music. There's not a verbal need to communicate with people. Mm -hmm. She plays uh, drums, keyboard, and guitar. And as she moves from instrument to instrument, she is, you know, she knows how to do that. When it, when it shows over though, she leaves the stage. She says, you know, thank you and walks off. Mm -hmm. She doesn't socialize with the bandmates, but she enjoys playing with the bandmates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so interesting. I'm a musician. I do a lot of music stuff and I'm also quite introverted in general. Uh, which is always uh, people are, always find that out. I think I think most therapists actually are pretty introverted. It turns out, but you know, because we can ex the particular form of being with people that we're helping is a very different relationship than just being sort of there in a undefined you know sort of relationship. But music in particular, I I can relate to what you're talking about. It's both internal and profoundly intimate at the same time. You're connected to other people, but not through. You don't have to talk to them much. You know, it's much more about this sense of sharing what's going on in the music. And we have found art. Art is very good. All mm -hmm. kids love art. And we shut them down way too early and tell them, oh, well, there's some great art and not so great art. And you're yep. skilled and you're not. We should do art throughout life. Mm -hmm. And this idea that, well, OK, I'm not good enough. I'm going to give it up. You know, I hope my daughters never give up art. Mm -hmm. um, I hope they enjoy pursuing that in different ways so art school and art lessons have been good music swim and what you do is you find your multiple communities where you fit in and i think that's how you find eventually a friend or two mm -hmm. understand that most people only have depending on the type of personality between five and ten close friends mm -hmm. there is nothing wrong with having one or two if that's what you can manage and that's what your mind can deal with mm -hmm. and i tell parents don't don't force it don't okay my kid's mm -hmm. got to be social i'm gonna put this kid in these situations 
I don't think that that's a healthy approach for neurodiverse connections. Neurodiverse connections have to be like all other connections, organically formed at their own rate with their own priorities. Yeah. Um, my wife and I, um, she's very introverted. She does uh, most of her work from home. She's her education is, is in aeronautical and mechanical engineering. Um, her master's degree is in technical communication. So she oversees compliance documentation, user manuals of, of very high end specialized engineering products. Mm -hmm. and, and she's been with the company for 17 years and is in a supervisorial role, mm -hmm. but she does it from home via email, uh, via the occasional chat. She doesn't like to have her camera on and, and her colleagues generally don't either. So mm -hmm. it, for, it, it's interesting to me that those relationships and connections within engineering are almost virtual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But this idea that your child has to be at every birthday party on a baseball team or a basketball yeah. team and has to be go, go, go with hundreds of people around your neurodiverse child only needs one or two things and only needs a couple of friends. Yeah. Yeah. And that the implicit message of forcing other things is just to enforce on a kid. Oh, you don't fit in. It just keeps reinforcing that message, which, of course, is counter to the, the child feeling like, no, I'm, I'm actually fine to be the way I am and just need to go with how I work. And actually, you could apply that to many children, not just uh, ones that have been diagnosed as, you know, with autism or other um, neurodivergencies. But there are just a lot of kids that that don't fit into that same mold either that we all seem to think that kids need this great social life and they need to do 500 after school activities and all the extracurricular that's they don't all need that yeah and some kids just can't tolerate it either no matter what the the fears that parents have about forming those relationships they focus too far into the future Mm -hmm. It's one thing to focus on building friendships and connections, but the parents leap ahead, as we said, to the marriage and intimacy and family, and they're omitting stages of development. You want to know how to get to the end point. Well, you can't get to the end point unless you have friends, because friends become the people you date, and the people you date might become intimate. And so I don't know why we are in... in that state of mind and, and it has been since i started speaking on these issues so it, it's not like it's new it's been going on for you know, decades the parents asking about uh, is my kid going to date have a boyfriend or girlfriend but as i said if you start with friendships it's going to be the person that you're sitting there with at math club or chess club mm -hmm. or swim team or music it's not going to be um the fairy book, oh, the, the fairy tale relationship normally, especially for an introverted neurodiverse person, it's going to be something that slowly emerges. And, you know, that's that has to be OK. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, it's interesting. Yeah, I think a lot of the, the antidote in terms of parents, and I, I apply this, of course, to couples as well, is the parents need to not panic so much. You know, when you talk about leaping ahead way far ahead, the parents often worry so much about are they doing it right or are they doing it enough and then they just transfer that anxiety to their kids and when you talk about a lot of this development stuff being organic a lot of that just requires faith that organic processes do work because they do and it's important to be honest with you, especially because autistics and neurodiverse children tend to be very concrete thinkers very uh, literal, mm -hmm. uh, very clear in what they want. When I talk to parents I and teachers, guardians, I say, let's do away with all of the euphemisms and the cute talk because that's not going to make sense. You may think it makes sense to lots of other teenagers or, or young adults, but it doesn't make sense to the autistic. Mm -hmm. You need to be direct. You need to be clear. And those things are important when it comes to relationships and those things that go along with 
puberty and uh, adolescence in general and then young adulthood, we need to be very direct, very clear, set rules and give very uh, process oriented understandings of situations. Hmm. I'm still working with my daughter to remind to remind our oldest when the concert's over, thank the other band members, hmm. thank your instructor. Mm -hmm. And she's like, well, but we did what we're supposed to do. Yeah. I know, but let's still mm -hmm. thank them. Mm -hmm. So just like I need that social prompting often from my wife, you know, I'm, I'm trying to give my daughter those skills because that way friends don't think she's aloof or ignoring them. Mm -hmm. And then there are things that we've talked about with her um, as she goes into what here in, is now called middle school. Um, you know, for, it was junior high when we were young. So, that's mm -hmm. a, you know, but we're trying to give her the same pointers that will be valuable as her friends start to pair up and they start to show interest in each other. We're not talking around it. We're, we're being very blunt and very forward. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's something where it's important. Um, and too many parents are uncomfortable with, or they tiptoe around explaining how relationships are going to work in middle school and high school and what is or isn't okay and what is or isn't healthy yeah you know when they they'll say things like now don't let someone touch you well that's vague we yeah. need to really yeah. fix this yeah so <laughs> well and know, a lot of that i think that reflects the parents often the parents own discomfort with their own experiences at that age which for many many folks you know, neurodiverse or not, with many, many folks, that was painful and awkward, and they still haven't figured that out necessarily. So trying to figure out how to talk to their kids is tricky. And I, it's interesting. I have heard from people how our parenting style, we know it's different. We know we are different parents. We are different, even as a couple, mm -hmm. um, because we're so forward with the kids and but that's what they need they need that clear understanding they don't want euphemisms and lies and and twisted uh ways of approaching the the information so even starting at, at 10 and 11 we're giving the girls information because some of their peers have already started their their menstrual cycles so we've sat down and just very bluntly with the the body book said okay you are 11 and a half there is a likelihood you will soon start your cycle here's what that means here's what happens your body is releasing eggs and we get very scientific and a lot of parents mm -hmm. are like well wow that's cool so our oldest needs a clear definition she wants to know why this is happening sure. we mm -hmm. can't just tell her it happens it's a girl thing yeah, yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. and which I think and, more parents should take your approach, frankly. Well, and some of the parents said, well, what about, you know, shouldn't that be a mom talk instead of a mom and dad talk? And we're like, look, if she's at school and needs to call one of us, one of us may be, be available and one may not be. Mm -hmm. And she needs to be able to say, you know, mom, dad, I started my cycle. Can you come get me? Mm -hmm. You know, or yeah. can you bring me a change of clothes or whatever she's going to need when that happens? Mm -hmm. We don't hide those things from her. Uh, we are very open about all aspects of her sexuality and what she's experiencing and what she's feeling. And we've told her if she doesn't want to ask us something, she has a legal pad. She can write down her question and mom and dad can write back the answer. Mm -hmm. If she wants to talk, we can talk. And the reason that's so important is that when she is 12, 13 and dealing with older kids around her, and I don't want her to wonder what's going on, and nor do I want her to feel broken because she doesn't like hugs or she doesn't yeah. particularly want to be touched. Mm -hmm. You know, we have bluntly said, well, look at mom and dad. We don't hold hands very often. We're both not very touchy but do we love each other? And she's like, oh, well, yeah. When one of you's sick, the other takes care and the other seem, you know, gets upset and yes, you, you care. Mm -hmm. So we tell her then it's okay. If you don't always like to touch and hold hands or whatever, as you get older, yeah. you just need a partner who will understand what you need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So great we, advice for anybody. We, yeah. Mm -hmm. And 
I think our teenagers and preteens, they need those discussions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's so interesting. I, one of the, uh, tell me if this, if this, uh, if I've got this right, or if it applies to you or to your daughters for that matter, one of the characteristics that often leads to a diagnosis of autism is someone who's not picking up some of the signals that people who don't have that diagnosis just sort of pick up without even realizing it. And I think it's the without even realizing part that's interesting because you are in a situation where you, for yourself and also with your daughters, you are aware of some stuff very explicitly that I think a lot of parents of kids who are not neurodiverse and where the parents themselves are not neurodiverse aren't even aware of. So they don't know how to talk about it. You know, you're you're able to identify some stuff through knowing about some stuff consciously that many people don't know about consciously, and that can be very useful. The the way I navigate is through a checklist, a process. Um, it it is something other teachers do more naturally. But I look and, you know, I have learned what is a confused student look like? What, mm -hmm. what is a, a confused expression? What is yeah. a confused habit? Mm -hmm. um, so because I do that, and I've, I've looked at the works of Paul Ekman and others on micro expressions, mm -hmm. I've looked at human body books to see what signals are that people do or don't do that are, are indicators of various things like how they hold themselves are they you know like this or are they like this and so there are things in other words are they holding their arms for those who can't see you know are they pulling their body tight have they put their arms around themselves are they at a loose stance more relaxed and and i have to do that i have to mm -hmm. analyze how is a person standing near me are they too close too far is their voice up is it down so i have to do that so i'm telling my daughters you need to do that mm -hmm. you know you need to think about that uh, so there's little things that I've been talking about with the, the girls that other people pick on naturally that I may not pick up naturally. They may not pick up naturally. Um, we had a, a very blunt moment with the 11 year old, uh, and I, this is a, you, you talk about couples and therapy. So this is a should be a familiar thing now my wife and i generally don't hint to each other because it doesn't work for us uh -huh. but you know my wife uh said after working out i'm gonna go take a bath okay and she's i'm gonna take a long bath i may take a bubble bath and i'm just sitting there and then finally the 11 year old said i think mom's hinting <laughs> and we talked about it and we actually had the discussion beforehand well what gives you that idea well mom doesn't normally take a long bath and she doesn't usually say she's going to use bubbles you know she left the bedroom door open you know these are clues right dad and it's like yes these are clues yes <laughs> and your 11 year old picked that up which is right and we talked about it and other people may say well gosh you know you're, now you're telling your child that you're you're going to go be intimate with your wife well uh -huh. like, okay yeah my 11 year old you know figured it out and that's fine with us we we aren't going to hide it from her and say oh no no you know dad's just gonna go get a, a towel for mom and no <laughs> we're not gonna you know so we don't lie to her we're going yeah, to say yeah. yes you know mom clearly wants dad to go in there and spend some time with her mm -hmm. you know mom um like so many people after a long day a nice bubble bath is relaxing and she would like dad to go in there and talk to her and maybe do some adult things and then she pauses okay what's an adult thing <laughs> you know, and, and those are you know and then that's a very valid sure. question legit question sure mm -hmm. and we don't say well we'll tell you later yeah mm -hmm. yeah and she uh she's come to us with very blunt questions and uh, based on the books she's reading or the things that she's learning mm -hmm. and other couples may hesitate or may not be comfortable with that or may feel like, well, there are things your child doesn't need to know, but we were stuck in lockdown for three years. Mm, yeah. Right? right. If you're stuck in lockdown for three years, how long can you tell your children? Well, mommy and daddy are tired. So we're sleeping in. <laughs> I just, how long yeah. can you, can you do that? Yep. And I think that's a, an important aspect of, of our parenting. We don't, 
we we don't hide all of that yeah mm -hmm. i just think that's a it's such a great story you know my most recent book the title of it is it's not about communication and i because I, I have the shtick about saying you know teaching people communication techniques doesn't usually help a couple do better but i put in there is one big exception there and that is for folks on the autistic spectrum because indeed if your situation is such you're not going to get hints I don't think I put it in exactly those terms, but I love your story. If your situation is you're not going to pick up hints yourself, then you can actually learn some techniques as all the stuff you were talking about. This is what I work with when I've worked with folks who are neurodiverse, which I have, I wouldn't, it's not a specialty, but I certainly have over the years encountered many couples where one or both are neurodiverse and sometimes they know it and sometimes they come to know it. Uh, but you know, it's fascinating. That's the exception. It's like, oh no, that's those are actually communication techniques. You can learn that as you were describing. You can learn to detect what does a confused look look like? You know, oh, this is my partner when she seems upset. This is my partner when she seems happy. Well, you need to know how to understand that. This is my partner when she's hinting around that maybe she'd like to, you know, play around. So those are all stuff you can learn. Those are communication techniques. And that's, a, you know, that's the big exception that I don't I don't like the expression, the exception that proves the rule, but it, it, that is a big exception. That's an important one. And I think that it's important to have these. Oh, um, forgive me. It's the uh, it's important to have these discussions with um, with your children. And as you said, it's it's not just your neurodiverse children in today's environment. It's always been all children. Yeah. Um, hiding things and when i think about the things that damage relationships you think about money career parenting mm -hmm. those are the things that are difficult for people how are you going to manage money how are you going to prioritize careers how are you going to parent or be a couple mm -hmm. and we don't hide these things from our daughters which means we're not hiding them from ourselves we talk about you know, okay, we have a, a household budget. Well, here's how a household budget works. Here how here's how mom and dad have worked out our spending priorities. Mm -hmm. And here's how we come to agreement and here's where we differ. Yeah. That that last part, especially, you know, on all of those topics, it's when what you're modeling for your kids is, of course, you're going to have differences of opinion occasionally. Here's how we work it out. And that somehow your your bond supersedes those differences you're able to tolerate those differences so that then you can actually work with them and then then you can come up with something you both feel good and that feels good and it's it's key for a healthy marriage and it's key for our children who are going to model us they're going to whether they're, you know the saying as you become your parents i yeah. i certainly know i have the good and bad of my parents uh, in me I know that the girls will have the good and bad of us and them. Mm -hmm. And we want them to see that we are willing to negotiate, that we talk, that we we work these things through. The, the approach that we have taken isn't right for every family, but I certainly believe that for my, my children and, and myself, this approach is working. I know that, uh, a lot of people would have different values and would say that what we are doing is you know not quite right morally or ethically for for their beliefs mm. um you know we have uh we don't do a lot of tv or movies with the girls mm -hmm. um and one of our our rules uh our guidelines is that we we don't really embrace violence violence isn't one of our things but i have no problem with them uh watching uh, we there are uh, there's some content that uh, can't, comes out of france uh it's a wonderful children's movie adal saint blanc um there's a scene where she's in the bathtub reading a book and it's a french movie and she's she's nude in the tub reading a book it's mm -hmm. a children's movie in France here. It's, you know, apparently appalling. Yeah. Um, I'm fine with my daughters seeing bodies on, on screen reading or whatever. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're not afraid of the French entertainment or uh, entertainment that we've seen out of Northern Europe, children's stuff. That's nonviolent. I am fine with them seeing what 
human bodies look like and what mm -hmm. goes yeah. on. And a lot of places that's just normal. That's normal. Right. I mean, we're watching a French movie with subtitles and it's a kid's movie. It's a PG movie there. Mm -hmm. uh, I can live with it. I actually object more to the world of the Marvel universe where people are being, you know, sliced and diced. Yeah. Sure. So yeah. as parents, because, uh, because I think that the values we watch and the values we prize are what our kids pick up on. Our daughters know that we would rather them be kind and generous and all those things. And that the way you react to challenges isn't blow things up. Mm-hmm. And I think those are those are signals that we're sending to the to the girls. So mm -hmm. and, and it says something about our values too. That and we want them to pick that up. We don't censor what they read. You know, mm -hmm. you want a book, can you read it? Read it aloud to dad, read it aloud to mom. Okay, we can yep, you can understand the words away we go. Mm -hmm. Um, so we don't worry about what they're reading because we're gonna talk about it, we're gonna read it together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Protecting kids doesn't really, I'm in that way, protecting kids by isolating them doesn't really protect them. And and I'm amazed at my, my university students um, weren't raised that way. So they're mm -hmm. only now discovering books that their schools had hidden away or whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, as we're, our approach to parenting is to tell our, the girls, yes, yeah, some some boys like boys, some girls like girls, some mm -hmm. some people like both. There are people who have gender dysphoria where they don't know if they're boy or girl and and that's okay too. And mm -hmm. we don't we don't want to hide any aspect of the world from them because as long as they have our values, then they choose their path. And I, I need to trust that. Mm -hmm. And I think um again, my wife and I being very in sync on that is important because when you argue about parenting it's it's like as i said money jobs and, and kids yeah yeah. Um, yeah and our parenting approach is you know and there are times when we have to negotiate where it's like gosh you know is that really the right time is it really okay mm -hmm. um yeah you're gonna have well you're two human beings you're gonna have differences occasionally and that just comes with the territory of any sort of relationship and it's important that we recognize uh for ourselves that our our youngest is not the same as our 11 year old, our mm -hmm. 11 year old, is, she's twice exceptional. She goes to a college prep school. She's wow. in honors, everything. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, so she is, she's really facing some unique challenges here. You have an 11 year old taking high school courses, um, you know, and in that social in the social settings with older students yeah mm -hmm. and she blends in because she's five foot almost five foot two mm -hmm. um so she blends in at 11 mm -hmm. she doesn't look like an 11 year old mm -hmm. um, and so we approach her very differently because she's what they call the twice exceptional we can really use that intelligence to help guide her um, as where her younger sister is developmentally delayed severely, um, has been, was held back and repeated kindergarten. Mm -hmm. She is not the same child. And at 11, mm -hmm. she will not be ready for the same discussions. Sure. She may not yeah. be ready until 12 or 13 for, yeah. mm -hmm. for, sure. yeah. for some things. So as parents, that's something we have to agree to as well as how do we treat our children fairly, but differently? So uh, I'm noting, you know, what a lot of what you do is you give uh, talks to various, you know, uh, conferences and things like that. Uh, could you tell folks how they could get in touch with you? And we'll put that, you know, we'll put your uh, information in our notes. The, the autistic me is uh, literally at, uh, I think it's autistic me on now X, formerly Twitter. You uh -huh. can look for the autistic me blog. The mm -hmm. podcast is called Perspectives on Neurodiversity. Ah. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the outreach that people uh, make is important. I, I appreciate any chance to, to speak on these. I I have attempted to get some books done. They're, the drafts are done, and it's one of those perfection things. It's never done enough. I want it oh, to yeah. be right. Been there. Yeah. And a lot of it is... A lot of it is people reaching out through other 
groups and organizations, they find, oh, you know, who did the talk for this autism society or who did this? So a lot of it's word of mouth and, and mm -hmm. I appreciate that too. Mm -hmm. But if people look for the autistic me, they look for, um, if they look for uh, Christopher Scott Wyatt, um, the long story short, I use the whole name, but it turns out there are several Christopher Scott Wyatt's in academia, including in neuroscience, that. an economist. There's a, a wonderful economist named Chris Wyatt. Uh, there's a music composer. So wow. you, <laughs> you do have to add the autism. If you don't put the autism in, you may, <laughs> you may find any number of us in academia. Yeah. And, you know, it can be funny because my, my research area uh, has become the uh, rhetoric of economics in uh, everything being an economics decision, policy, special education, special needs. So now I overlap with the economist with my uh -oh. name. <laughs> oh my, yeah. <laughs> so, but if you look for the autistic me, it's on uh -huh. I, Facebook, LinkedIn, you, you name it. I'm trying to have those social presences and I try to be available. It, I am an active prof uh, instructor, lecturer, whatever. So I have five courses that I currently teach at mm -hmm. Texas University, a public one of our public R ones. Mm -hmm. So teaching five courses, my availability is a, a little different than it used Sounds to be. Like it. <laughs> I can imagine. Well, we'll put that information, uh, you know, uh, uh, contact information in the notes for this episode. Thank you so much for doing this. Well, yes, thank, thank you, you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Well, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed that interview with Scott as much as we enjoyed having him on our show. Yeah, really, really great stuff there. Uh, so before we wrap up, let's just put in a couple of uh, plugs here for the books that I wrote and the book that our sponsor wrote. Right. So as we talked about Reigniting the Spark, Why Stable Relationships Lose Intimacy and How to Get It Back. And It's Not About Communication, Why Everything You Know About Couples Therapy is Wrong. Indeed. And, uh, and you know, we it's... also didn't mention, yeah, let's mention those some two. of our other ones. Now, yeah. there's the one that people can get for free, right? Let's when tell they... people about that. Okay, so uh, if you sign up for Bruce's newsletter that comes out monthly, I think. About, 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 about monthly. once a month, yeah. Right. Uh, Bruce will send you... Um, a PDF to seven words to jumpstart your love life. Indeed. So what Judy is holding up for those of you who are watching is a paperback copy, which you can get from Amazon. If you want to spend a few bucks for it, you can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm saying, no, you don't even have to do that because I'll send you <coughs> a PDF for free just by signing up for my newsletter. And how would people sign up for my newsletter? Well, they can go back to that same website we mentioned earlier, ctn7.com. And when they do that, they will see a box appear before their very eyes mm -hmm. saying, click here to sign up for Dr. Chalmers' newsletter. So do that. do that. And once you've done that, you'll get that PDF. And, of course, you'll also get my newsletter, which is worth it. You know, yes, I mean, it I, it's I have fun with it. interesting newsletter. Yeah, thank you. I, I think <clears throat> so, too. Yes, yes. indeed. And then there's also another mini book available. My husband complains about my cleaning. What do I do? Yeah. Hint. It's not about the cleaning. And it's just funny. It's funny I wrote a book with that specific <clears throat> a topic, but mm -hmm. people were asking about that specific a topic. So yeah. I figured, well, I'll write a book for them. Uh, let's put in another word for our sponsor. The Blue Tent, Erotic Tales from the Bible by Laria Zilber. Those of you who watch the intro to this episode will note that we couldn't lay our hands on the book, but it was right there. And... It was hidden in plain sight. <laughs> and so Judy just held up the book. And um, if you like uh, erotica, mm -hmm. and it is quite explicit erotica, mm -hmm. and if you like the Bible, and I say if you like the Bible, this is not a, you know, this is not a disrespectful send up. This no. is a very, very loving, respectful treatment of uh, stories from the Bible uh, where you just fill in a lot of blanks and go beyond mm -hmm. and get into very explicit right. uh, erotic detail. And if you enjoy erotica and, and if you uh, enjoy, <clears throat> you know, learning about the Bible, you will love that there book. You so you can get that at lauriazilber.com. Or Amazon. Or or Amazon, exactly. Yeah, Larry Zilber. The, the website will send you to Amazon. You can just search for it on Amazon as well. Right. And so until next time. Remember, be kind. Don't panic. And have faith.